We are live talking here with Dan Schreiber, the one and only, and we're talking to him for both the UK Ghost Story Festival and Horrortree.com, two birds with one stone here. Dan, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Oh, thank you. Very excited to be doing two interviews at once. Never done that before. I know. This is like, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to you know, be efficient with time. <laughs> is one is one of the interviews more hard hitting and got a lot of criticism, and the other you got to you got to yeah. somehow smash the two. Yeah, absolutely. So, right. ghost, ghost story festival interview questions are about ghost stories. Yeah. Everything else is, you know, I'm putting on my sixty minutes hat. Yeah, hard hitting dig in. Okay, so, let's yeah. do it. Great. Awesome. All right, <laughs> but uh, obviously, one of the reasons you are appearing at the Ghost Story Festival is the book, The Theory of Everything Else: A Voyage into the World of Weird. And I'm wondering how much fun was it researching this book? Yeah, I mean, it was. I've never enjoyed writing and researching so much, and I've been doing it ever since I was 19. Sort of quite hardcore research into subjects I don't know via you and and other things that I've done throughout my career. Um, but this kind of felt like a different territory altogether because it was fascinating having the challenge of trying to work out, looking at anyone from history, anyone who would seem even the most sort of rationalist kind of character and trying to get to the bottom of what their bit of batshit or bananas, if you don't want me to swear, mm -hmm. is the one thing that sort of sits outside of all of the the sense that they've made out of like the logic of how science explains the world and just have a tiny thing and then and then drill into has that tiny thing influenced how they thought and and did the world change that way and the best bit was i i would argue there's virtually no one that you look into who doesn't have just that one tiny little thing uh that is a bit crazy actually i did find one one it's actually a group of people uh who were crazy sorry who had zero crazy in them which was the band wet 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 I can't find anything about them. There's nothing. They're just down the line normal. Um, yeah. And as I built a chart where you've got someone on the extreme end at, at number 10 and at zero is wet, wet, wet. And okay. no one else joins wet, wet, wet. There's plenty of tens. There's no one else but wet, wet, wet at zero. They're just wanting the love all around and that's about it. That's so, it. Yeah. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's their interest. Because it was really weird. I said, it's an interesting interesting challenge to try and give yourself to look at anyone and try and work out what the madness is within them and one of the things I did was I thought okay wait 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 I'm going to look at the artists on the four weddings and a funeral soundtrack let me see who here would fit anywhere on this scale of one to ten of batshit mm -hmm. and, and it's extraordinary you got the, the three main players you got wet 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 you've got the composer I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now of the of the score for four weddings and a funeral and then you've got Reg Presley, who is the writer behind the song Love Is All Around, lead singer of the Trogs, so did Wild Thing as well. And Wet Wet Wet's at zero. The, the guy who did the score is in the middle because at one point in his career, he collaborated with a lady called Rosemary Brown, who's in my book, who claimed that she had channeled all of the classical musicians who'd passed away, the notable ones like Liszt and Beethoven and Mozart. And they all wrote original pieces through her. And he had approached her about a piece that he was trying to play live that he couldn't crack by Debussy. And she said, oh, he tells me you should do this with it. And he was like, what? And he tried it. And he was like, oh, my God, that's that's it. That's right. And he, and he believed that she was talking to him. So he's at like number five. And Reg Presley, I don't know if you know about him, but he, you know, he was very much into UFOs and crop circles and alien moonshine. And yeah, so... Just that one soundtrack, you've got the full spectrum. It's very fun to do. That's amazing. So, I mean, where where did this idea come from for for digging into to this spectrum? Well, I I grew up at um a, a bit of Australia. So you're an Aussie, you know. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Sydney in your time, um, yeah. but if you have. There's a bit of the northern beaches in Australia, which is uh, manly, and then there's this famous Palm Beach, which is where uh, Home and Away, the beach is set. Uh, that's where they do all the filming. One suburb up from it was a place called Avalon, which is where I moved to as a kid. And Avalon was very much Hippieville at the time. It was so new age. And everyone who basically came to our house when we were kids 
always had just like they'd sort of like leave von Daniken books which is like ancient alien theory in our house or they what our neighbors moved inland because they believed that a tsunami was going to take out all of the the coast of Australia because um she had a dream where that would happen and they sold up and they moved and so I always had these people and as a kid I thought oh the stuff's all real and then I was sent to a Rudolf Steiner school and the Rudolf Steiner school system is very much a system of occultism in its roots and so on even though that's not at the forefront of it now but that's that's in the background bubbling away and all the teachers were quite I say hippie-ish because they were hippie-ish um but it does come from quite dodgy backgrounds the whole Rudolf Steiner system and I just always enjoyed it I always enjoyed the speculation and the the interesting stuff that people thought that was different because life can become a bit boring if you just go about your day-to-day -day job mm -hmm. you forget to remember we're in a universe it's, it's insane that we forget that every day but you can you can go a whole day and not look at the sky and go jesus we're in this infinite madness on a ball hurtling around the sun and these little theories often make you just go wow what if we don't know everything and so i've always been obsessed with that and i think it's funny and interesting and yeah. everyone argues that if you believe in this stuff then you're going to be a conspiracy theorist of a like far right nature and you're dangerous and i believe that's right if you believe in the stuff but if you just enjoy it then that's that's the best dinner party conversations ever and that's that's where i always sat on it and also yeah. who knows what's going on who knows we don't know absolutely absolutely and you, you mentioned that growing up in Australia, you were born in Hong Kong as well. And I know as a fellow Aussie, I know Australia has its moments of weirdness. Yeah. Um, and, and the culture in that part of the world is very strongly influenced by mythology and folklore. Do you think that that had any influence on your growing up or was it the ancient aliens books being left in the house? I think it was more the ancient aliens because there wasn't much in my area of Australia until I only found out in the last two years that just up the road from where we lived, a sort of 20 minute drive, there's a road called Wakers Parkway where it's the reportedly the most haunted road in um, Sydney. Oh, wow. And it's on the same road. And so the story is, is that there's a lady who would appear she used to be a nurse and if you were driving late at night down this road people would look in their rearview mirror and they would see a lady sitting in the back seat and they'd quickly turn and she's not there and it kept getting reported multiple multiple times this one stretch of road and there was a documentary maker who was a former home and away star who looked into it and found who that person could have been and so they've actually identified a person who would be matching the description of this old nurse and I didn't know that when I was growing up. I used to play basketball on that road just off it. And so I, that would have influenced me at the time. And then digging into it, I found there's a sort of unique cryptid. So cryptid being like a Yeti or a Loch Ness monster. And it's unique because it's an it's an elephant humanoid that lived in the Narrabeen Lake, which is just running off the most haunted road. So suddenly it's like Skinwalker Ranch there. It's like there's, <laughs> there's multiple paranormal activity and cryptid parent, um, activity. And I had no idea my whole childhood. So no, I didn't, nothing, nothing really Aussie. The, the stuff that I liked and the book, the book is not just looking at paranormal stuff. It's anyone who's got a theory. It's, it's my, I love that we're all detectives and we're all working on something. And if you look, someone's trying to crack all the basic things that are, that are lost to time. So the Aussie accent is one. We don't know how the Aussie accent developed. So there's multiple theories and they're all hilarious to me. The, there's one, which is, because it was so hot and there were so many flies, the reason the Aussie accent developed is because everyone had to talk with their teeth closed, otherwise the flies were getting. And that's just a wonderful, silly theory that we, we can't disprove, but you can't prove either. There was a guy, there was an academic in Australia who came out not long ago saying that he thought that the early uh, settlers in Australia, um, when they first moved over, they were just getting so drunk all the time that it's just a drunken like oh, oh my, what are you, you know and that's how the accent developed through just constant drunkenness obviously all the aussies who hear that are just like did you slanderous dick but <laughs> you know it's it's a theory that this guy's put together and pushed and so yeah that's the stuff that i love from from oz yeah um those are my, but yeah my favorite theories from australia are all to do in that kind of territory just silliness really yeah Oh, that's awesome. And 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 you mentioned there some of the, the crazy theories. You know, is there anything that even now, I'm sure you wrote the book a long time ago, but by the time it got out there, anything that still sticks out to you as, oh my God, why would they even think that? 
Yeah, I, I what I love is when it's someone who's super famous, who's who's a big character who pushed something and kind of doubled down on an idea. So there was a guy called Lewis Leakey who was a anthropologist, paleoanthropologist. He looked into um he found some of the most early versions of man and bones and early hominids and so on and he um and he's and he's hugely influential. He was quite a controversial character as well because he was eccentric as hell. But he pushed a theory near the end of his life that the only reason that we became the dominant species of this planet, or one of the main reasons, is because not of our fighting power, not because of our brain's ability, not because of our knowing how to make fires and scare and all that stuff. It's simply that we were too smelly to eat. We were just really smelly, and any predator that wanted to eat us would sniff us and go, actually, I'm good, and walk away. And so we were just left alone because we stank too much. And he pitched this in front of conferences of scientists and, and archaeologists and anthropologists. And he did this, like, it's written in a book. And I just love that. What a stupid. And, we, and the comedian in me loves the idea that history happened because of comedy conceits. Yeah. And look, well, here we are, I think we're like this incredible species that was like meant to dominate the planet. No, we just were smelly. That's yeah. what it was. We stunk too much and they just couldn't be bothered with us. Yeah. Yeah. Because he said he was staying out in the in um Serengeti, I think it was, and he said a lion came up and sniffed him and just went nah, and turned around and went off. And then he said this to his students, and they said, We had the same thing as well. And then the other said, We had the same thing. Mm. And so he thought, my God, what if what if that's like still the case? Because do how many humans get and I think he's wrong in this. I think they do eat humans, but they often eat humans in desperation, they often eat humans at like if a hyena eats a human it waits for us literally to rot and be full of maggots before it will eat us like that's the better version of us to a hyena than <laughs> what this is right now so he put all this evidence together no anthropologist i've spoken to gives it any any sort of uh credit whatsoever yeah it's funny yeah. it's great that yeah awesome <laughs> <laughs> um well i mean we we are obviously talking for the Ghost Story Festival as well, and yeah. talking about the haunted roads in Sydney and all these sorts of things. Um, and you mentioned there you are, of course, a comedian. Many people will know you from your podcast, from your work on on QI, um, and and all of these sorts of things. So, I'm wondering what sort of role do you think comedy can play in this world of the weird and the wonderful and the ghostly and the paranormal? Uh, well, I mean, it's always played a huge role culturally. I think you know, like. If we think of some of the biggest ghost movies, Ghostbusters has to be up there, right? As a as a perfect blend of taking these subjects serious while also being funny with them. The reason, I mean, that it was taken so seriously is that Dan Aykroyd is a fully fledged mm -hmm. ghost hunter believer from a family that literally were ghost hunters. Um, his dad and grandfather, like he's from a dynasty of ghost hunters. He believes mm -hmm. he's been in bed with ghosts and and spooned a ghost all night is one of his stories. Um, so, you know, comedy is often about truth and you often write about the things that fascinate you most. So I think, yeah, like in that respect, and like if you look at even the the recent years of comedy that's been coming out, everything from the League of Gentlemen, anything that's got the sort of morbid paranormal stuff, um, and more and more, you know, even things like Stranger Things have a hell of a wit to them you know because it's just it, those are the best yeah comedy comedy and and ghosts i think are very intertwined as a as a thing yeah it's not just about the scares it's about the light relief as well i guess yeah exactly and the silliness of it all and the yeah it's 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 a perfect comedy premise you know to to sc scooby-doo you know send a petrified person in looking for a thing, uh, often a ghost, or we'll turn, and then you'll get your reveal that it wasn't a ghost. It was, uh, you know, yeah. the the principal of a of a school who's pissed off or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's well for me. It's a very tied in, yeah, relationship. Absolutely, and there's no pesky kids to stop you from, you know, finding out the real reasons for things. So that's good. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, do you have a? favorite ghost story at all something that comes to mind immediately um do you mean like my favorite fictional story or like a a story about a real ghost uh in... either or really I mean you spoke about the nurse earlier so if you've got maybe a fictional story that that you really love 
Um, fictional story that I really love, ghost wise. I, I love reading um, Joe Hill's books. He's the son of Stephen King. Um, and he wrote a book called Heart Shaped Box, which just has such a brilliant premise, which is a guy who's a rock star who um, is very obsessed with uh, memorabilia and occult, occult memorabilia, particularly. He buys a ghost off eBay or one of those sites and he orders it someone's selling the ghost and it comes to the house and he thinks i've just bought what's a quirky item mm. but there is a ghost in it and the ghost then tries to kill him as well as his girlfriend and so on and that was that was really but like that premise alone for me was a was a great premise um then i love um my my fate it's interesting i i often like a story just because of if I read something, I'd love to find the background out about it because of the nature of what I do for a living. And my favorite thing is when Mary Shelley came up with Frankenstein. So obviously they were they, they were tasked to tell each other ghost stories. And I think I think specifically ghost stories, and she came up with Mary Shelley, uh, sorry, with Frankenstein. Um, my favorite thing about that was they were staying in Lake Geneva in this house. And that was the story that was Byron and Shelley and Percy Burris, Burris Shetland, however you say his name, I can't remember. Um, and then one other. And there's a hotel which was, and they were really famous at the time. Like Byron was proper celebrity. I didn't really appreciate that celebrity kind of existed properly in that way, but it did. And so there was a hotel that was up on a, on a mountainy hit bit that was looking down at where they were all staying and people knew that they were staying at this place so the hotel when people were booking out rooms particularly rooms facing that side they were offered to be able to rent a telescope specifically to spy on what would become one of the most i mean if you were a time traveler and you didn't want to interfere that's when you go you go to the hotel book out the telescope and watch as history is about to be made as we get frankenstein and the vampire story uh you know these these iconic moments from the most iconic dark and stormy night it's i i love stuff like that I, no one's ever told me that there was people curving on them from a hotel across the the road which i think is just awesome that's brilliant i hadn't heard that either that is just fascinating isn't it and that in itself yeah. is the premise for a story you know, exactly so, yeah that would be amazing the night i spied on shelly and and byron um, yeah. So yeah, so that that's ghost stories, is it? And we're going to be talking about them a lot. Which, as we are speaking now, it's a week until we all kick off in Derby. Is yeah. There anything yeah. particular you're looking forward to at the festival? Um, I, I, there's so many, there's so many people on that list who I look into, and I just think this, I, I would love to go to all this stuff, and I, unfortunately, I'm going to be going in close to when I'm going to be on stage and I need to get out so I'm going to try if not seeing events I'm going to try and track down a few people just to say hi I love your work um there's one guy going who I think is going to be a really interesting talk because he created quite an iconic uh moment in in British culture and he's called Stephen Volk um and I mean in in your in your world he's probably extremely famous um I know him through his work more so you know so Ghost Watch uh which is one of the like defining tv shows of prankery and and hoaxism and and all that sort of stuff and then he did Gothic which was a Ken Russell movie which was all about the night that Mary Shelley came up with the with the story of Frankenstein so I, I would love to bump into him and say hi. I'd love to see his his talk as well. But um, I, it's such a I just love the idea of this festival. I think it's such a it's an interesting one because most ghost festivals are going to be specifically about uh, people who believe in ghosts and they'll be going to talk about experiences with ghosts. And I actually think this is the better way around because this just brings everyone in. Everyone loves ghost stories. You don't necessarily need to believe in a ghost in order to enjoy it because you just enjoy a ghost story. But Obviously, a lot of the people who are going to be talking there are going to be authors who do have an interest in it. So you kind of get you. It's it's very inclusive of people who don't believe in it and do. Mm. And I think it's actually that's kind of a model for how more of these events and festivals I think should be run because it allows you to come in as a non-believer, maybe even leave as a believer, but come in as a non-believer and just enjoy the sort of fiction of it all. 
yeah. Uh, that yeah that seems quite unique to me so i'm kind of interested just to snoop around and just see how it's being run and so on for that reason awesome well we need to make sure that you get to have a beer with Stephen volk before you head off yeah i'd love yeah. to say hi yeah <laughs> Awesome. Um, Dan, thank you so much for your time. Uh, the, the obvious question for me now is how can people stay in touch with you? There are so many things that you do. Where would you point them as a, as a starting point for your work and how can they follow you? Oh, uh, well, I, I mean, the, the thing that I do on a weekly basis is um, no such thing as a fish, which is this podcast uh, where me and three other QI writers sit around the table and each bring our favorite fact from the last seven days that we've discovered and we just discuss it and there's four shots so if you don't like the first fact you might like the second one you know so it's a it's quite a nice show uh the one that we just did that hasn't gone out yet i had a fact on which is that in order to oh w wb yates the poet um once had a vasectomy to cure his writer's blog because back in the day vasectomies were seen as something that was giving you as it were a second puberty it was kind of like it's going to knock the hormones back into you and sort of give you like a doctor who regeneration like just right. you're like brand new and, and fresh and he was going through a slump in his writing and so he thought if i do this um it could be uh useful and it worked it worked in a placebo effect or it worked for real i don't know but it worked for him it, he he had a second wind in creativity right off the back of it so that was very cool so that's that's no such thing as a fish i also do a podcast called the cryptid factor with reese darby who people might know from our flag means death which is the new, new taika waititi pirate series and he was murray the manager and fly the concords and he's in jumanji is also happens to be the funniest stand-up ever i think he's yeah. he's just genius when we do a show all about uh cryptids it's just literally talking about the mysteries of the universe and talking about yetis and stuff and so that's really fun i would highly recommend checking that out um but in terms of like actual like contact i'm on twitter uh I'll, my username is schreiberland i'm on instagram on the same thing those are my two main places um yeah so yeah, yeah those are me i'm not gonna ask you for like your home address and phone i was about to give it so i'm glad you stopped me yeah <laughs> uh dan thank you so much for your time uh hopefully everyone goes and checks you out you're speaking on friday night at the ghost story festival um and if you can't get there the theory of everything else is out now in all good bookstores slash some bad ones as well i'm sure yeah i want to find these bad bookshops where are they I didn't, they, they don't I didn't exist bad bookshops don't exist no, surely no they don't i think there's a, there's a few uh, there's, there's a specific online platform we might not want to mention but uh oh yeah 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 but my book's going very cheap on there at the moment if anyone did want to head there uh <laughs> good to know nice yeah <laughs> inside tips awesome thank you so much